Hey, what's up, everybody? Back for another Twin Peaks episode review. Uh, we're at episode four. The uh, title of the episode is Rest in Pain. And this is the halfway mark for season one. Season one has a total of eight episodes. So we're halfway there. And uh, it's very densely packed with a lot of important information. So I'm not going to waste any more time on what we're going to get right down to it. All right, we start off with Audrey, dressed in red, wonder what that's about, uh, meets Agent Cooper in the hotel dining room. Dale immediately notices her perfume, of course. Um, Audrey tries to play coy about uh, his and his suspicions that she wrote the letter about One-Eyed Jack, or uh, a Jack with one eye, um, is confirmed by her handwriting. So yeah, we've, re re we've uh, confirmed something. Um, that Dale pretty much knew from the get-go. Um, we also know that Audrey is obviously aware of One-Eyed Jack's existence because of the note, and which, you know, why does she know? Um, it's possible that uh, it's something that she overheard her father talking about, maybe. Um, I mean, he would be the one that uh, knows it. Maybe he heard another girl at school talk about it. It's hard to say. Uh, we learned that Laura did work at the perfume counter, so that is confirmed, just like Ronette Pulaski. So our connection is there. What are the odds that Laura went from the perfume counter to One-Eyed Jacks to uh, work as a escort slash hostess or whatever? Um, I think it's uh, the odds are <laughs> getting better all the time. All right, so uh, Sheriff Truman and Lucy show up. Uh, you know, they just were called the, the night before, t and Dale told them that, uh, yeah, I, I know who killed Laura. So, obviously, uh, <laughs> Dale uh, breaks down this dream and all the vital, vital points of it. And like I said, it, this is also a very good spot to revisit if you need to uh, refresh. If you're, if you're further down and you're getting kind of confused about some of the things that are happening, it's always you can always revisit this part, too. It's another good, good spot that we get a lot of uh, re reveals of information that we know and some new stuff um so yeah he mentions um harry and lucy were both there in the dream which it wasn't revealed so that's something new um he mentions that uh, mike and bob were uh, kind of a team together doing some uh, pretty nasty stuff um but mike eventually got tired of doing it and he removed the arm um and then shot bob and we don't show that or see Bob when we see him. It doesn't look like he's been shot or anything. And Mike said that he saw the face of God when he removed the entire arm. So something happened to him that made him decide I'm not going to, you know, kill anymore. Um, yeah, so that's all new information. Uh, Dale also reveals that Deputy Hawk sketched the face of the man that Sarah Palmer saw in her vision, which we now know is Bob. And this is yet to occur. So this is giving us a bit of a glimpse or that Dale um, via his dream is is being shown things that at least partially things that have, are going to happen in the future this might um, be something that plays a big part and it may not but we do know that we know because we've watched previous episodes that this event has not taken place yet um, we know that um, both have of the these guys um, or at least in Mike's case had uh, a tattoo that read um, fire walk with me. And we also remember that we ha are, were shown a bloody note was found uh, at the train car where Laura was murdered that had the same phrase written out. So we've got written in blood and a tattoo on an arm of these two guys. So the, the, uh, there's some there's a definite connection there that's not a coincidence by any means. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, most of these guys must have been up to some pretty bad stuff because we now know that they're both confirmed killers. And as Dale says, break the code, solve the crime. All right. So now we're going over to the um, the morgue or the yeah, I guess it would be the morgue, the morgue. Um, and we get to uh, see our friend Albert again. He continues to show that he's such a charming person. Um, even to the point where uh, old Harry Truman, Sheriff Truman, uh, cold cocks him <laughs> with one of the most telegraphed punches I think I've ever seen. I mean, if that Albert could not dodge or see that coming is uh, is pretty amusing. But Albert does get a few lines off. Um, he puts Ben Horn in his place for sure because Ben comes off as a you know kind of a like a sorry 
want to be kind of politician type talk, you know, BSing him. So he realizes he's full of it. Um, eventually Dale steps in and puts Albert in his place because they're fighting over, because Albert wants the body to, um, do extensive forensics, but the funeral is scheduled for the day. So the town of Twin Peaks wins out over the evil Albert. Um, at the Palmers, you get to see a little bit of the, the, uh, kind of the soap opera called Invitation to Love. And Le Leland's kind of sitting there kind of half out of it. It's kind of a side joke that runs along um, with the uh, show. You know, it's like everybody in Twin Peaks, like at least certain people have watched it. We're, we're, we're kind of led to that they watch it habitually. So, you know, but it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's like a tongue in cheek kind of gag thing that goes wrong where there's some parallels in it. But it's, it's there more there for like comedy. It's nothing, you know, it's not going to reveal anything um, by watching it, but it's there. Um, then we have a mystery person shows up. And I don't know, she looks very familiar to you and me <laughs> if you take a close look. So yeah, this is one of the elements of the show where you have to suspend disbelief in a bit. because And you know, just uh, take it as is. No, it isn't Laura come back from the grave, or Laura is really alive and under um, some kind of, uh, you know, double, body double or whatever. You know, it's just Maddie, Maddie Ferguson. Um, so yeah, don't, that don't, they, they don't, they don't try to lead you down that path anyways, but I'll just, you know, s squash it. So yeah, that, that, you know, they're not trying to pull any of that kind of stuff. That would be kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of stupid. Um, yeah. So now Norma's, uh, talking with the parole advisor or something because her husband Hank is about to have a parole hearing. Apparently he's, a uh, not a great guy either. And she's not really thrilled about him possibly getting out. All right, so now uh, Dale and Harry Truman uh, visit Leo. We know he's a scumbag and a wife beater and a liar, and this just re re you know uh, reaffirms everything we know about Leo. But Dale does have some info on him coming in, but Leo doesn't seem to be phased by it at all. Uh, they ask him where he was the night of the murder. He claims he was on the road near Butte, Montana, and that he called Shelley at the time. And they, uh, he says that Shelly will uh, confirm this if they ask him. But, of course, Leo knows that Shelly's not going to come forward willingly with any details because he beats her. Um, Bobby is still the angsty teen. Um, and his um, poor Major Briggs is uh, trying to comfort him. And he's getting at a loss of how to, you know, communicate with his son. We're back now at the uh, sheriff's station. And this is uh, another good part for all you... Uh, Twin Peaks sleuths out there and putting your detective caps on and uh, trying to figure out the uh, mystery f as we go along. Um, Albert's back, apparently not none the worse for wear after a sheriff put him in his place. And he's got some new uh, evidence for us. Uh, the cocaine that, well, the Dale, then the little plastic baggie that Dale said was going to possibly have cocaine in, in it that Harry was, uh, you know, no, that's not possible. It was ID'd positive for cocaine, and the toxicology reports confirmed that she did indeed take um, drugs. She was using cocaine, so we've confirmed that. Um, we find out that her wrists and upper arms were bound um, by two different kinds of twine at two different locations, I believe it was said. Um, Albert demonstrates how she was bound, and this immediately reminds Dale of something from his dreams, when the uh, the apparition or whatever you want to call it of Laura says, sometimes my arms bend back. So now we know that we've got a something that took place in the dream and that has manifested itself in the waking world as a clue. So we know that there is truth to what um, Dale was uh, shown in his dream. It's not, you know, we're getting some actual confirmation of that. Uh, Albert says that uh, pumice and industrial strength soap was found um, around or outside the train car, um, probably in a little puddle of water or something. Um, he comes to the conclusion that the killer washed his hands. He put uh, his hand under the back of Laura's neck and leaned in for a kiss, which is, you know, after post-mortem. So, yeah, uh, that gesture could have a lot of different meanings. So, I mean, it is a, an interesting thing to think about, even though it is a bit morbid. I mean... That act in itself has uh, could you know, mean a lot of things, um, depending on the relationships Laura had, maybe uh, with the killer or uh, not. You know, like I said, it's just something that uh, you can uh, ponder about. Uh, we see that claw and bite marks on her shoulder are 
most likely have been done by an animal. Um, Sheriff figures that out and Albert <laughs> mocks him. I love that line. I use that line when I'm uh, trying to, you know, put a, somebody says something stupid or whatnot, you know, I'll, I'll usually just say that to give him a bad time. You know, look, it's, it's trying to think. <laughs> it's a good one. Reminds me of the Nero Wolf uh, um, episode where he tells uh, his sidekick, you know, don't, don't think you'll injure yourself. It's a good one. Um, finally, uh, well, I guess I should say, um, we don't know if this, the bites and claw marks, uh, or claw and bite marks, um, were done post-mortem or if they're done when she was alive. So we don't know that yet. And finally, a pl fragment of plastic with what he believes to be the letter J on it was found in her stomach. The letter J, here we go again. That was, uh, the big clue in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, diary. Um, and a piece of plastic, what could it be? What can we, uh deduce from what we know so far. I'll leave that up to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, think about, and I'm sure you can come up with an answer pretty quick. Um, well, Albert wants payback for getting punched, and Dale defends the sheriff and basically reveals um, you know, his true feelings for the town of Twin Peaks based on his experience of four. And needless to say, Dale has basically fallen in love with the place. I think he's bas he's supposed to be like a big city you know, um, boy, um, I think, you know, f working out of Philadelphia. So the, uh, kind of the, the small town life and the, in nature and everything is kind of something kind of new to him. So it's kind of, it's kind of fallen under the spell, I guess, of Twin Peaks. Uh, we see, uh, Nadine basically reminding Ed of how huge a mistake it was for him to marry her. Um, and that apparently Norma and Ed have history and they were, I, I'm assuming high school sweethearts. Um, so something happened to, uh, to cause that, to uh, hit that particular course of history to change. Um, cause yeah, Ed obviously he just is not like Nadine and he's just, you know, he made a, a dumb mistake. Uh, James is distraught and says he can't go to the funeral. Back at the Great Northern, uh, we see Audrey, who is a funeral attire I can only describe as lesbian femme fatale. Yeah, that's a drastic change in look compared to when she was talking with Dale with her uh, curly hair and, you know, and red blouse. Um, and we do find out that there's, there's a peephole that she's able to look in on, at least, I'm, a, I'm not sure if it's the dining room, it's one of the rooms in the hotel, or one of the uh, private areas in the hotel that the family, you know, quarters or whatever. And we know that um, Laura, or um, she mentioned that her father was singing to Laura. Uh, maybe she saw this through that peephole. If she knows that, obviously she probably uses it a lot to spy. That and this, you know, leads us to you know the conclusion of what what more does she know? She might have seen a lot of stuff that she's not telling us. We'll have to find out. Um, now we're going to the funeral. Uh, and Dale is you know kind of looking around and seeing. Um, the faces of all the people there, um, kind of judging their reactions, you know, those that might be suspects. Um, and after the, uh, the, the preacher says his words, um, Bobby, um, interrupts and basic and states a very important point, um, that the people in Twin Peaks, they all knew something was up with Laura, but they continued to put on appearances as if this, you know, nothing was amiss. And this kind of brings back the idea I was talking about of the small town having a kind of a contrived appearance on the surface, uh, which hides, you know, things beneath that are much darker and possibly more sinister. So that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the flip side of, of, of the apparent um, quaintness and um, wholesomeness of small town America, that things can be on the surface can be contrived to make it seem like it's, it's you know, more perfect than it actually is. Uh, Bobby and James go at it. Uh, Leland uh, jumps onto the casket, and the, the mechanism that lowers it and raises it goes haywire. And yeah, it's it's pretty comical, even though it is morbid. Um, and then you at the double R, Shelley uh, recreates the casket scene with that napkin dispenser and those two old guys. Well, the first time I saw that, I I, I couldn't. I was probably uh, you know, I don't know it's if it's t twisted or not, but I was just laughing so hard when just the the expression on those old guys' faces is just. I don't know. It's kind of bizarre. It's almost like they're over there. You know, just these kind of really weird e expressions on their faces and her um, reaction to it. I thought it was just hilarious the first time I saw it. Um, Ed Harry and uh, Deputy Hawk are all there. Um, and Ed says, that, you know, he's not, uh, he doesn't, 
necessarily trust uh, Coop, uh, Dale Cooper um, and that he's not one of them and he's not going to figure it out. I'm assuming he means the case and not, but it could have mean just the, the bet that they made, um, which Dale um, ends up uh, getting Harry um, to win the bet because he figures out that Norman Ed um, have a, something going on between them just based on a little bit of their uh, look and body language with each other. And now we get to an even, you know, another extremely important part. And uh, this is when Harry um, begins to explain what I was talking about um, in my overview video about Twin Peaks being sort of in its kind of, you know, its own sphere of existence or outside the bounds of the rest of the world and in kind of a supernatural way. And that specifically the woods, um, a presence in the woods, as he says, which it could be, might be evil or merely just kind of peculiar and strange and otherworldly. Um, this presence that exists there is the price that they have to pay to live in the place like Twin Peaks, which is the Twin Peaks that Dale knows and has fallen in love with. Um, now we know that what Ed was referring to when he was on uh, Lookout or Stakeout, and Harry reveals that there's a what Dale calls a secret society, which I think it, give, I think just saying it's calling it a secret society kind of rom over over um, romanticizes it, and I think in kind of gives it a little bit of a, I guess, a depth and significance um, that isn't really there. Um, it basically, it's like, you know, it'd be like the, the guys, they're, they're basically just protecting the, the people from the town that aren't aware of this by, you know, keeping an eye on it. But, it, you know, secret society seems kind of, you know, kind of uh, overkill as far as the name. Um, but given that previous generations were aware of this presence that, that existed, and they obviously eventually at some point they created this, you know, the Bookhouse Boys. Um, we can assume that this is not a recent phenomenon, that this presence in the forest has been around, you know, it's multi generational. Uh, yeah, so Dale gets to check out the Bookhouse, um, and we see that Bernard Renault is uh, being questioned apparently about drug trafficking, or they found some drugs that he brought in. Um, he is the um, janitor at the roadhouse, his brother Jacques is the, or Jacques is, uh, the guy that was tending bar that, um, Ed thinks poured him a Mickey <laughs> that, uh, caused him to get KO'd by old Bobby Briggs because he didn't see it coming. Um, and we also see that James is also initiated as one of the bookhouse boys. So he's got some inside information on some of that as well. So, he, you know, he's privy to some knowledge, I guess, um, that we didn't know that he was privy to otherwise, basically. Um, and we should see that uh, old Shelly uh, sm smartens up and got herself a pistol to protect herself. Good thinking. Uh, Harry meets with Josie at the uh, Packard house, and obviously Harry is head over heels. I mean, he's like, you know, putty in her hands, so to speak. Uh, she is very uh, concerned um, about the notion that Catherine and Benjamin may be trying to get rid of her. Um, she goes to show Harry the ledgers to, to provide some evidence for her uh, concerns, but they are not there. And we are also shown that Catherine has been, you know, eavesdropping on the situation, and then she was also aware of um, Pete giving Josie the key to that... Uh, at safe or vault or whatever. So she's, uh, lets him know as <laughs> if they want to go, uh, want to go about it. Don't sneak around or the next time basically is what he's telling him. Um, then we go to the uh, graveyard and, uh, Dale sees a, or a figure, you know, dressed up and kind of, <laughs> kind of an odd, odd ensemble. Um, it's, uh, Dr. Jacoby you know, who's, uh, brought flowers to Laura's grave. And uh, J Dr. Jacoby reveals that he's basically, as a therapist, at least in recent years, is, is a complete fraud because he doesn't feel any empathy for his patients anymore. He just kind of listens to them, but he doesn't care. Um, we aren't told why this is or if anything in the past caused it, but somehow Laura becoming a patient of his managed to you know, bring him back from this kind of apathy or this stagnation, apathetic stagnation, if you will. 
Um, he's, you know, kind of starts to break down a little bit and he's hopes that Laura can forgive him for not coming to the funeral. And maybe there's other things that he's inferring, you know, that, that she would need to forgive him, uh, for maybe he did something to her. Remember, he is still a suspect. All right. Uh, yeah. Remember he was the one when Dale threw the rock and hit the glass uh, bottle, but it didn't break. I will go back to Josie and Harry. Um, she thinks that uh, that her uh, late husband Andrew was was murdered, and that there was foul play involved. Um, she also mentions about Ben wanting um, the the land, and we do remember that Ben was proposing that Ghostwood project to the Norwegians. So, and that Catherine and Ben are in cahoots. So maybe that is uh, maybe her suspicions are not merely paranoia. Uh, we go back to the uh, Great Northern uh, to conclude the episode, and uh, Hawk tells us um, about some of his own spiritual beliefs um, and the soul and whatnot. And uh, they, uh, and all he says, and all he says he's to Dale is the only she thing he knows is that uh, Laura is in the ground. <laughs> so you know, not much to go on by his, by his uh, by what he believes in. But it's interesting, and that's an interesting little conversation. Then all of a sudden, some uh, music kicks in, and uh, old and Leland, who seems to have kind of appeared out of nowhere, just it's almost like he's in a trance, um, or just you know, just so out of it from from you know the grief that you know he just starts kind of dancing, and then he's going up to people, begging them, to, people to dance with him, and making a scene, and and yeah, so they have to escort him out, and like obviously the uh, the grief <laughs> from from all that's going on is starting to really get to him. And at the very end of the episode, we see that traffic light with the uh, red light uh, shining and the uh, ominous music. So it always seems to pop up every every now and then. It's a kind of a, something that's symbolic. So, uh, yeah, that is it for this episode. Um, I, I, you know, uh, I always wanted to try to keep these a little bit shorter than they are, but given the nature of this show... And that it is a mystery and that there's tons of information, you know, it's like sometimes I just, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta take as long as needed. Believe me, I have my sheet in front of me and I'm going on the uh, list as much as, you know, as, as, you know, streamlined as possible. But yeah, there's a lot going on in these next few episodes. I mean, it's just chock full of stuff and stuff that you don't want to miss. Um, so yeah, I won't, not going to say much more. Um, I did notice some on, uh, at least on mines. I don't know if people are subscribing only to mines and not to YouTube. Um, if you want to, if you so subscribe to both, I mean, that'd be awesome, but either way, um, I saw people thumbs up, giving some thumbs up for the video. I appreciate that very much. And, uh, hopefully this one will, um, be uh, to your liking like the uh, previous one is. And I'm going to conclude this video here and I'm going to get uh, number uh, episode number five all uh, set up and recorded and I'll have these up in uh, no time. Until then, uh, take it easy.